Chapter Fourteen of The First Men in the Moon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The First Men in the Moon by H. G. Wells. Chapter Fourteen Experiments in Intercourse. When at last we had made an end of eating, the Selenites linked our hands closely together again, and then untwisted the chains about our feet and rebound them, so as to give us a limited freedom of movement. Then they unfastened the chains about our waists. To do all this they had to handle us freely, and ever and again one of their queer heads came down close to my face, or a soft tentacle hand touched my head or neck. I don't remember that I was afraid then, or repelled by their proximity. I think that our incurable anthropomorphism made us imagine they were human heads inside their masks. The skin, like everything else, looked bluish, but that was on account of the light, and it was hard and shiny, quite in the beetle-wing fashion, not soft, or moist, or hairy, as a vertebrated animals would be. Along the crest of the head was a low ridge of whitish spines running from back to front, and a much larger ridge curved on either side over the eyes. The Selenite who untied me used his mouth to help his hands. "'They seem to be releasing us,' said Cavour. "'Remember we are on the moon. Make no sudden movements. Are you going to try that geometry?' "'If I get a chance but of course they may make an advance first. We remained passive, and the Selenites, having finished their arrangements, stood back from us and seemed to be looking at us. I say seemed to be, because as their eyes were at the side and not in front, one had the same difficulty in determining the direction in which they were looking as one has in the case of a hen or a fish. They conversed with one another in their reedy tones, that seemed to me impossible to imitate or to find. The door behind us opened wider, and, glancing over my shoulder, I saw a vague large space beyond, in which quite a little crowd of Selenites were standing. They seemed a curiously miscellaneous rabble. "'Do they want us to imitate those sounds?' I asked Cavour. "'I don't think so,' he said. It seems to me that they are trying to make us understand something. I can't make anything of their gestures. Do you notice this one, who is worrying with his head like a man with an uncomfortable collar? Let us shake our heads at him. We did that, and finding it ineffectual, attempted an imitation of the Selenites' movements. That seemed to interest them. At any rate they all set up the same movement. But as that seemed to lead to nothing, we desisted at last, and so did they, and fell into a piping argument among themselves. Then one of them, shorter and very much thicker than the others, and with a particularly wide mouth, squatted down suddenly beside Cavour, and put his hands and feet in the same posture as Cavour's were bound, and then by a dexterous movement stood up. Cavour! I shouted. They want us to get up! He stared open-mouthed. "'That's it,' he said. And with much heaving and grunting, because our hands were tied together, we contrived to struggle to our feet. The Selenites made way for our elephantine heavings, and seemed to twitter more volubly. As soon as we were on our feet, the thick-set Selenite came and patted each of our faces with his tentacles, and walked towards the open doorway. That also was plain enough, and we followed him. We saw that four of the Selenites standing in the doorway were much taller than the others, and clothed in the same manner as those we had seen in the crater, namely, with spiked round helmets and cylindrical body cases, and that each of the four carried a goad with spike and guard made of that same dull-looking metal as the bowls. These four closed about us, one on either side of each of us, as we emerged from our chamber into the cavern from which the light had come. We did not get our impression of that cavern all at once. Our attention was taken up by the movements and attitudes of the Selenites immediately about us, 
and by the necessity of controlling our motion, lest we should startle and alarm them, and ourselves, by some excessive stride. In front of us was the short, thick-set being who had solved the problem of asking us to get up, moving with gestures that seemed, almost all of them, intelligible to us, inviting us to follow him. His spout-like face turned from one of us to the other with a quickness that was clearly interrogative. For a time, I say, we were taken up with these things. But at last the great place that formed a background to our movements asserted itself. It became apparent that the source of such, at least, of the tumult of sounds which had filled our ears ever since we had recovered from the stupefaction of the fungus, was a vast mass of machinery and active movement, whose flying and whirling parts were visible indistinctly over the heads and between the bodies of the Selenites who walked about us. And not only did the web of sounds that filled the air proceed from this mechanism, but also the peculiar blue light that irradiated the whole place. We had taken it as a natural thing that a subterranean cavern should be artificially lit, and even now, though the fact was patent to my eyes, I did not really grasp its import until presently the darkness came. The meaning and structure of this huge apparatus we saw I cannot explain, because we neither of us learnt what it was for, or how it worked. One after another, big shafts of metal flung out and up from its centre, their heads travelling in what seemed to me to be a parabolic path. Each dropped a sort of dangling arm as it rose towards the apex of its flight, and plunged down into a vertical cylinder, forcing this down before it. About it moved the shapes of tenders, little figures that seemed vaguely different from the beings about us. As each of the three dangling arms of the machine plunged down, there was a clank and then a roaring, and out of the top of the vertical cylinder came pouring this incandescent substance that lit the place, and ran over as milk runs over a boiling pot, and dripped luminously into a tank of light below. It was a cold blue light, a sort of phosphorescent glow, but infinitely brighter, and from the tanks into which it fell it ran in conduits athwart the cavern. Thud, 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 thud came the sweeping arms of this unintelligible apparatus, and the light substance hissed and poured. At first the thing seemed only reasonably large and near to us, and then I saw how exceedingly little the Selenites upon it seemed, and I realized the full immensity of cavern and machine. I looked from this tremendous affair to the faces of the Selenites with a new respect. I stopped, and Cavour stopped, and stared at this thunderous engine. "'But this is stupendous,' I said. "'What can it be for?' Cavour's blue-lit face was full of an intelligent respect. "'I can't dream. Surely these beings—' "'Men could not make a thing like that. Look at those arms. Are they on connecting rods?' The thick-set selenite had gone some paces unheeded. He came back and stood between us and the great machine. I avoided seeing him, because I had guessed somehow that his idea was to beckon us onward. He walked away in the direction he wished us to go, and turned and came back, and flicked our faces to attract our attention. Cavour and I looked at one another. "'Cannot we show him we are interested in the machine?' I said. "'Yes,' said Gavor. "'We'll try that.' He turned to our guide and smiled, and pointed to the machine, and pointed again, and then to his head, and then to the machine. By some defect of reasoning he seemed to imagine that broken English might help these gestures. "'Me look em, he said. "'Me think em very much, yes.' His behaviour seemed to check the Selenites in their desire for our progress for a moment. They faced one another, their queer heads moved, the twittering voices came thick and liquid. Then one of them, a lean, tall creature, with a sort of mantle added to the putty in which the others were dressed, twisted his elephant trunk of a hand about Cavour's waist and pulled him gently to follow our guide, who again went on ahead. Cavour resisted. 
We may just as well begin explaining ourselves now. They may think we are new animals. A new sort of moon-calf, perhaps. It is most important that we should show an intelligent interest from the outset. He began to shake his head violently. No, no, he said. Me not come on one minute. Me look at him. Isn't there some geometrical point you might bring in apropos of that affair? I suggested as the Selenites conferred again. Possibly a parabolic, he began. He yelled loudly and leaped six feet or more. One of the four armed moon men had pricked him with a goad. I turned on the goad-bearer behind me with a swift, threatening gesture, and he started back. This and Cavor's sudden shouting leap clearly astonished all the Selenites. They receded hastily, facing us. For one of those moments that seemed to last for ever, we stood in angry protest, with a scattered semicircle of these inhuman beings about us. "'He pricked me!' said Cavor, with a catching of the voice. "'I saw him,' I answered. "'Confound it!' I said to the Selenites. "'We're not going to stand that. What on earth do you take us for?' I glanced quickly right and left. Far away across the blue wilderness of cavern I saw a number of other Selenites running towards us. Broad and slender they were, and one with a larger head than the others. The cavern spread wide and low, and receded in every direction into darkness. Its roof, I remember, seemed to bulge down, as if with the weight of the vast thickness of rocks that prisoned us. There was no way out of it, no way out of it. Above, below, in every direction was the unknown, and these inhuman creatures, with goads and gestures, confronting us, and we two unsupported men. End of chapter.